Um, I'm no longer the president, but I am the director of agri-knowledge uh, for the company. And what that means is there's 30-some guys like Marcus and I that have PhDs or master's degrees. Uh, where's Waisaki? Is he in the crowd? There yep. he is. He's one of our seniors who support around uh, 120 agri-coaches and geo-coaches who work directly with farmers. We don't sell any inputs. We only sell information that helps farmers grow bigger crops. And one of the things we focus on tremendously is balancing nutrients with water. It's all about balance, and that's how we can squeeze as much yield as we need to squeeze out of the water that falls, no matter what our rainfall. And Marcus and I are both Norwegian, and I caught the joke, Minnesota, I got that. We're both Norwegian, and maybe that's why the two of us are tag teaming here, uh, because it might take two Norwegians to make one other nationality, I don't know. But uh, there we are in our, our Viking gear. Um, one thing I do know for sure, I gave a keynote a number of years ago and I did a lot of research. And what I know is in the next 35 years, we have to grow all of the food that we've grown in the last 10,000 years. Okay, so in the next 35 years, we've got to grow all of the food that we've grown in the last 10,000 years which means on every acre that you guys are farming, by the time we hit 2050, yields will be at least 70% higher on every acre, which means if we're going to get to where we need to get to in terms of food production, we've got to seriously think about what it is that we're doing in terms of balance and nutrition and soil quality and all kinds of things that Jill Clapperton and others were talking about today. And that's a big challenge. It's a huge opportunity. And the truth is, um, we've done this before. I was born in 1956, so you guys can do the quick math. And when I was born, there was about 2 billion people on the planet. Today, there's what? 7 point something. And in that period of time, we've more than doubled the production of uh, what we're growing on every acre that's out there. So we, we can do it again. Most of the yield that we lose to crops is to abiotic stress. Too cold, too wet, too dry, too hot, too something, too salty, too pH-y, abiotic stress. The red bars you see up there are the maximum yields that have been achieved by the various crops that are on, on that graph. The green portion of those bars is the average yields that we achieve on an annual basis. The little yellow piece is the loss that we get to weeds, diseases, and insects. We spend billions of dollars fighting those pests. We need to spend a lot more time fighting abiotic stress. And part of that comes through balance, and part of it comes through a lot of different things, and maybe this is where you get to say something. <laughs> so give her. One yes. of the things that's really exciting is that we're already moving in this direction. I mean, we're already moving towards um, producing more food and fiber on every acre that we're growing um, food and fiber on. Uh, you might have caught this in some of the, some of the press here. Uh, Randy uh, Dowdry from Georgia grew the world record corn yield as of, as of uh, this last cropping season of 503 bushel. Um, that's huge. Uh, that's huge. I realize we're not growing corn here, um, but just to put it in context of the genetic potential of the crops that we're, what we're, that we're growing, when you really stop and consider what the potential is out there, it's, it's astounding. One of the things I think it's important for us to point out in all of that is the nutrient um, removal associated with some of those, some of those crops. And, and just take a quick look at that there, um, removal uh, at that yield environment, 337 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre, 176 pounds of P205, um, 125 pounds of K2O, and then about uh, 40 pounds of sulfur. But to take that one step forward and to talk about the nutrient uptake, the total nutrients that it takes to grow that crop to that yield environment is just astounding. Uh, it, it's it's mind-boggling. I mean, uh, we're talking about 560 pounds of nitrogen that it took to grow that crop. Uh, you're, looking, you're looking at over 250 pounds of, of phosphorus. And the one that I find most astonishing is, is the potassium, 680 pounds of potassium to grow that crop. 
And, and I realize we don't grow corn um, as much in, in this group probably as, as they do in other parts of the, of the country. Um, but the point here is that we're growing today's yields on the nutrient management practices of yesterday, on the decisions that we made yesterday. Um, today's yield environment is not the yield environment of yesterday's either. And if we're going to support a yield environment that's 70% more than what we're dealing with today, we need to start making decisions today that are going to facilitate that kind of yield environment. And some of it comes with changing up how we're doing things, um, timing of application, total product going down, et cetera. This is our challenge. This is our opportunity. And uh, I, I think it's quite exciting. It's very exciting. So one of the things that we do know from people like this that are growing these kind of yields, and yesterday I was reading about some dude in Iowa or Indiana or someplace that grew 103 bushel soybeans, is that we need to start thinking like plants and we need to start applying nutrients in such a manner that we spread it out over time and space. So if you look at the fertility programs that are associated with this guy, or the people that are growing 100 bushel soybeans, or 180 bushel wheat, or you know whatever the crop is, they're mimicking mother nature by spreading nutrients out over time and space. And so if I plant any seeds here today, atoll, that's the seed I wanna, wanna plant. If we're gonna get to 70% more production, by 2050, and there's lots of young people in the crowd that'll be still around here farming by 2050. I've met more young soil scientists at this conference than I've uh, ever met at a conference. Um, if we're gonna get there, we gotta start mimicking mother nature, spreading nutrients out over time and space. And when Marcus says, um, you know, we're growing this year's crop on past management, we need to start getting stuff in, in place to accomplish what we need to accomplish as we grow forward. There's lots of tools we can do to do that. Time and space is about different times. So fall application, spring application, at seeding, in crop, all of the high producers are doing multiple, multiple applications using soil testing, tissue testing, et cetera, et cetera. And then some of the other tools that we have, um, you know, ESN, uh, Agrotain, on and on and on, all kinds of different tools and synergies, combinations, placements, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so if there's one thing that I've learned in direct seeding over the last little bit in Western Canada specifically, we're constantly going to wider and wider row spacing with narrower and narrower openers. And that's great for clearing straw and a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's shooting ourselves in the yield foot when we go to those wide row spacing and narrow openers. It's very, very yield cons constrictive and um, it's something that we have to deal with in our part of the world at least. And so if you're there, talk to somebody and make sure if you're going to those wide row spacings. When I, when I first started doing research, we were on seven and, inch row, seven and nine inch row spacings. A lot of machines now are up to 14 inch row spacings for canola and wheat and barley and stuff like that. Not so hard on canola or mustard, but it's really tough with crops like wheat, like barley, like peas. It's really, really tough. And basically, at the end of the day, we need to mimic Mother Nature. Because at the end of the day, from a plant's perspective, timing is absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. And so within our group, with the agri-coaches that are in the room, um, and there's three or four of them sitting around, one of the things that they encourage people to do is to figure out ways to spread nutrients out over time and space We've got more and more growers using melted urea. This is one example as a carrier. Um, and so every time they go over their fields with um, you know, whatever pesticide or whatever it might be, the crops are also getting a shot of nu nutrition. So uh, something to think about if you're not doing it already. I want to point you to a really good article, a really good publication from Australia. And uh, I got the, the, the web link up there. If somebody wants uh, some more information after the talk, just come talk to Marcus and myself. It's all about water use efficiency, uh, nutrient use efficiency, et cetera. It covers the planet. And I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, in terms of water use efficiency and nutrient nitrogen use efficiency, it's absolutely critical, and I'm now talking mostly to the young 
people in the crowd. It's absolutely critical for all of us to understand what it takes to grow a bushel of anything. The truth of the matter is most of us don't know that. So if I told you it takes 50,000 pounds of water on average to grow a bushel of wheat, some of you will quickly run to Google or pull out your calculator and start calculating because you think I'm full of baloney. But it takes at least 50,000 pounds of water to grow a bushel of wheat. We need to know this stuff if we're trying to get as, as much efficiency out of the water that we're, that we're uh, trying to deal with. We need to know that one inch on, of rain on average, this is in the United States now, grows about 130 pounds of grain on average. There's people in this room that's blowing that away. Three, two, three, four times more efficient than that. As we grow forward, we're going to have to get more and more efficient um, in order to get to where we need to get to. When we're looking at something like nitrogen use efficiency from the fertilizers that we apply, these are the numbers for the United States. One pound of fertilizer nitrogen grows about 40 pounds of wheat on average. We got to do a lot better than that globally. Fortunately, North America, US is well ahead of the, the, the global average, but as we grow forward, we're going to have to do a lot better job of growing more grain per pound of everything that we apply. And part of the answer is getting more water use efficiency, and part of the answer of getting that is through better nutrient balance. Water is the most important nutrient that we try to manage next to CO2, and um, it's really about balancing everything with, night, with water. So at the end of the day, Marcus and I, and the coaches in the room, and the senior coaches, that help the coaches, help you guys, it's all about this on your farm. It's about reallocation of scarce resources, driving down your cost per unit of production so that um, you can get the biggest bang for your buck. So we're gonna take just a, a quick step back. Uh, we're gonna take kind of the, the, the 94 million light year view of agriculture with the question of, of what are the three most essential but often unmanaged inputs into agricultural production. Um, and Elston alluded to them already, but really we're talking about water, we're talking about carbon dioxide, and we're talking about solar radiation. This is, this is what we manage. As agricultural producers, this is, this is the reaction that we really manage. We're taking atmospheric carbon dioxide, um, and we're combining that with water, and we're using solar radiation, plants as the vehicle to drive the reaction to produce carbohydrates and, and oxygen. This is actually a very beautiful reaction. I mean, this is, this is the reaction that really supports life. You talk to any um, high school kid or, or uh, grade school kid, a lot of times they're gonna know that, that plants take um, carbon dioxide and water and they, and they produce uh, they produce sugars, right? But it's, but it's actually more than that. We could, um, we could talk about um, the role of, of nitrogen in terms of producing the biomass. We could talk about the role of potassium and the role that it plays in setting up uh, the concentration gradient that allows water to move into that plant. We could talk about uh, chloride and the role that it plays in regulating the opening and closing of the stomates on the underside of the leaf. We could talk about the role of manganese and the role that it plays in the Hill reaction and splitting that water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, the only place in the natural environment where that reaction actually occurs in the Hill reaction of, of photosynthesis. Um, we could talk about the role of, of boron and the role that it plays in uh, cell differentiation and meristematic uh, development and, and root exploration. That. The, the point here is, is that it takes a lot more than just carbon dioxide and water to produce photosynthates. And, and it's our job, really, to manage this reaction. But we can actually take it one step forward. What we really are trying to do is to optimize the amount of, of quality nutrients that, are, that were in the food, that, that's in the food we're producing. Whether we measure that in terms of protein or whether we're made, measuring it in, in terms of, of, of gluten strength or vitamins or minerals, zinc, whatever. This is really what we're trying to do. We may sell it in bushels. But what we're really selling is, is energy, energy that we've converted from solar radiation using photosynthesis.
quite cool. It's essentially alchemy at its finest. You guys take very basic elements and turn them into very complex foodstuffs, and it's basically alchemy at its, at its very finest. Thinking like a plant, somebody said that earlier here today. If I'm a plant, what do I want for CO2 concentration in the atmosphere to optimize my production, speed up yield, the whole thing? Any greenhouse guys in the crowd? Where do I want my CO2 to be? It's at 400 parts per million or so right now, right? Where does a plant want CO2 to be? Sorry? Quite a bit more, right? 1,000 to, to 1,200 parts per million. That's where a plant wants to be. So is there something that we can do as farmers growing forward to let the plant see more CO2 other than just burn a bunch more coal and petroleum products? The answer is probably, but we've got to put our heads to it and think about it a little bit. In terms of water use efficiency, when I ask people how many pounds of water it takes to grow a bushel of anything, nobody ever knows. And when I tell them the answer, it's 50,000 pounds for wheat, it's 67,000 pounds for canola, it's 69,000 pounds for soybeans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they go, their first reaction is, it's, I think it starts with, one of the words starts with B and the other one starts with S. But it is. And at the end of the day, water is the thing that we're trying to manage and nobody measures it. And if some of you in the room are measuring it, good on you, because hardly anybody in the industry measures it. And in dryland agriculture, it's by far the most important thing that we need to start measuring so that we can get a better handle on what our yield potentials are. And if additional yield shows up in the growing season, figure out how to capture that yield potential because as I said earlier, water drives everything, whether there's too little or too much. It drives everything when it comes to crop production. This really simple formula works for our part of the world. It works for most of this part of the world. It gets you in the ballpark. So this simple formula basically says the first four inches of water that's either in the soil that, or that falls on the soil goes to the factory. And now I'm talking annual crops, mostly spring crops, be a slightly different number for winter wheat. Four, first four inches go to the factory, every inch after that goes to yield. And if you're a really good farmer, you're gonna grow more bushels than a guy that is just kind of in the middle of the pack. And it really gets you into the ballpark. So I don't know, what's the Seattle Stadium? What's it called? Safeco? Century. Okay, so the idea behind this is it gets you in to the Century Stadium to watch those guys play, and it gets you into Section W. It doesn't get you into Section W, Row 13, Seat 2, but it gets you in the ballpark. It gets you in to the section, and it's the simplest formula on the planet, and yes, you can tweak it for your area, and nobody, nobody hardly uses this simple formula. And then you need information like this. So the red bars indicate yield under, under either poor management or poor conditions. The top of the green bars indicate yields, typical yields under excellent management or good conditions. I know some folks in the Palouse that, are, that anticipate 10 to 12 bushels of winter wheat per inch after the factory is built. Maybe some of you guys are in the room and maybe some of you are already calling BS, but um, that's what you do. You connect some dots, and at the end of the day, you can figure out clearly what your yield potential is based on a water-driven basis. And where the biggest advantage comes is when we're, especially when we're spreading out nutrients over time and space, is we can take advantage of yield opportunities that appear during a growing season. And it just takes some dot connecting. It's not that hard. Any agri coach can help you do it. Um, Marcus and I can certainly help you. So at the end of the day, it's all about balance. And the first thing a plant wants to grow is roots. Right, Marcus? I'm agreeing. All right. So skill testing question. I'm a wheat plant. It's the middle of June. 
What volume, what percent of the volume of soil directly beneath me do my roots come in direct contact with? So I'm growing away, everything is hunky-dory. What percentage of the volume of soil directly beneath me as a wheat plant do my roots come in direct contact with? I heard 90. It's way high. Somebody said two, it's 2% on average. So if you're thinking like a plant and you're helping that plant now to go from 2% to 4%, what have you done in terms in a, from the plant's perspective? You've doubled its root system. What have you done in terms of its ability to take up water and nutrients? You've increased it. We gotta think about what we're doing in order to get a crop root dominant so that it explores more soil, so that it can use nutrients and water more efficiently. At the end of the day, the first thing that a crop wants to do is grow roots. It wants to be root dominant. The second thing it wants to do is grow shoots. It wants to grow leaves, rapid canopy. The roots pick up water and nutrients. The canopy picks up solar radiation and CO2. So if we're thinking like plants, that's what we're going to focus in on. And when we're doing that, we need to make sure that everything up here is all balanced. For you guys over there, all of those nutrients need to be balanced with water. And really, it's about which, which fish to fry first. I've had the good fortune of being able to f travel most of this planet in my job and for pleasure. And I see folks do things in all different parts of this planet um, that we should be doing here. And I see stuff that we're doing here that they should be doing there. And uh, some of the things that we need to think about when it comes to utilizing water as efficiently as possible is the things that Marcus talked about before, things that we don't normally talk, think about. Um, we don't normally measure water. We don't normally think about, geez, how can I help that plant create a solar panel quicker? Um, we don't think about those things. We need to start thinking about those things more because really at the end of the day, it's about which fish do we want to start frying first. And I want to pick the big ones first, for sure. One thing that I do know is affecting a lot of fields, less so in direct seeding systems, but there's compaction in virtually every field that we walk on. And so if some of you have got soil tests, two key nutrients you want to look at. Percent base saturation of magnesium, percent base saturation of sodium. So if you're like most farmers that I work with, you've got 20 or 30 fields, some few of those fields are likely going to have elevated levels of magnesium. Look for base saturations greater than 20% magnesium. Look for sodium greater than 2%. Those will be the first fields that will compact on you. And you can get that straight off a soil test, uh, a good soil test. Normally you'll have two layers of compaction. One will be there as a result of the sins of your grandfather or your father, and the other one will be as a result of more recent sins. And some of them will be there because Mother Nature just didn't really like you too much when you, your folks came and homesteaded or whatever. Almost every field will have at least one or two layers of compaction. And when you start talking about compaction and we're thinking like a plant now, that's going to constrict root systems, that's going to constrict water use efficiency, nutrient use efficiency, etc. And so what I'm really saying is that for some of the young people in the crowd, for sure, before we're done, even when you're in direct seeding systems, uh, more and more of us are going to be pulling low disturbance rippers across fields to get rid, rid of some of this compaction. So continuing, continuing on with this concept of, of identifying the biggest fish to fry, what's the biggest problem that I need to address first? Northwestern Montana, Intermountain Valley, um, I'm dealing with soil pHs anywhere from literally 4.3 to 9.3, okay? So if I'm dealing with a soil, a field that has a pH of 4.3, I can guarantee you the biggest fish on that field is not how am I gonna apply my nitrogen. Um, the biggest fish on that field is what am I doing to address that particular problem? To, to continue on with that, um, what we're observing is that we've got a high degree of spatial variability when we start talking about these big fish. 
whether it's compaction, whether it's sodium. I've got another field probably uh, uh, about 18 miles away from this one where my sodium levels literally go from about 250 parts per million to 2,500 parts per million. Okay? We've got parts of that field that are literally, literally white where water does not drain, um, where we get very poor infiltration, crops drowning out, etc. Okay, so the big thing here is to identify these big fish and start moving towards strategies to address them. Because at the end of the day, if we can't get a crop to establish, if that crop doesn't thrive, if it doesn't drive roots, if it won't take in moisture, we've just short-circuited the whole photosynthetic process. Here's something you can take to the bank. Those of you that are taking notes, if you've got a random soil sample from a field and the pH comes back and let's say it's 5, pH 5. First thing, pH 5, your nutrient use efficiency is cut in about half. Okay, so whatever you're putting on in terms of nutrients, about half. But a random sample that says 5 tells me with absolute certainty that parts of the field is going to be pH 4 and other parts of the field is going to be pH 6. You can take that to the bank. The only place that that falls apart is when you've been using lime. If you haven't been liming, you got a pH 5, guaranteed you got areas that are 4 and areas that are 6. Okay? You can take that one to the bank. And so if you've got average soil samples that are saying 5, 5.2, something like that, you know there's going to be 20 or 30 percent of the field that's a really big fish called low pH that will be in the fours. And that's where things really start to fall apart in a hurry. So when it comes to pH, this is something Everybody else on the planet, they get a soil sample, the first thing they look at is soil pH. In Western North America, for some reason, most of us go, yeah, big deal. If you're in the UK, if you're in Germany, if you're in New Zealand, Australia, almost everywhere else, first thing they look at, and then they fix it. This is where we need to spend a lot more time. Because at the end of the day, soil pH messes up a lot of things. It messes up root growth, it messes up nutrient uptake, it messes up water uptake, it messes up a lot of stuff. And yeah, there are other considerations that you need help with. If you've got a surface soil that's got a pH of 5 and it's underlain by soil that's got a pH of 7 or 7.5, seven that's a completely different world than if you've got a surface soil that's 5 underlain by a uh, subsoil of 5.2. Completely different worlds. So you need to pick which fields to start with. This is Mike Delinsky, another senior coach. Some of you might have uh, ran into him over the years. He loves taking pictures. This is a wheat root, a healthy, happy wheat root at three days in uh, soil that doesn't have a low pH. So you see the white roots and the little filaments coming off there, root hairs coming off there, and the little globule, globulin thing at the end, that's what a root wants to look like. Here's what happens when you grow that same wheat in a soil pH that's low and has high aluminum levels because of the low pH. Not very happy. Happy root, not happy root. Happy root, not happy root, not happy root not happy root. So what I'm really saying here is that if you do know you have some fields that have these kind of issues, get by the best shovel you can buy and wear that sucker out this summer when you're out looking at your crops. Look at your root systems. That's where the brains are in the plant. That's the first thing it wants to grow. It wants to be root dominant. There's no way this plant's going to be root dominant. This one's got a good crack, but these three don't. The one thing too along those lines, we have to remember that uh, soil acidification is a gradual process and the impact sometimes can be masked by, you know, we, we say it's something else, maybe it was wireworm damage or is nitrogen deficiency or whatever. Um, it's a gradual process, we need to identify it early, we need to under understand that there's, there's a high degree of spatial variability associated with it and start chipping away at it. If we've let it get, now this is my personal opinion here, but if we've let our pH go to, let's say, 5 before we address it, we've already compromised nitri er, uh, fertilizer use efficiency by 50%. So that means 50%-ish 
of, uh, of every dollar that you spend, only 50, uh, 50 cents of that is actually getting into the crop. Okay? So we haven't lost it, but it's, it's not getting into the crop. The other part of that is we've compromised yield potential too, again, right out of the, right out of the gate. Okay? And, uh, and if we're waiting until we get to a critical level, um, we're costing ourselves money. So at the end of the day, there's seven steps or seven R's of yield quality maturity, uh, profitability, and sustainability. And it all boils down to this balancing act that we're, we've been talking, uh, talking about here this evening already. We don't have time to get into all of these aspects, but uh, you can readily get this through our website and various other publications. Talk to an agri-coach and they can help you with it. Um, just want to touch on a few things here. The first R is the right mindset. And part of the right mindset is thinking like a plant. Um, and a lot of people laugh when I say that, but once you start thinking like a plant, everything gets a lot simpler. That big blob of gray stuff between our ears often confuses things. If we think like plants, things get a lot easier. Really highly recommend that. We need to get the crop off to the right start. We need to create root dominance. So how do we do that? Well, there's lots of different ways we can do that. The trouble is with a lot of our direct seeding systems, at least where I'm living now, we're actually creating zones of nutrient exclusion and we're burning up roots, not creating root dominance. And so we need to think some of this stuff through because a plant, the first thing it wants to do is grow those roots and become do root dominant. Give her, Marcus. So we've, we've talked a little bit about this already, um, but really 80% of the biomass that we're talking about in crop production is below the soil surface. We don't even see it. Uh, a lot of times we don't even consider it. 2% uh, of the soil volume is, is really all that that plant touches. And we need to be doing everything we can to make sure we're, we're maximizing the uptake of the particular nutrients that we're concerned about. Along those lines, we have to remember that we've got some nutrients that are mobile in soil and some that are immobile in soil. And so developing a strategy around how are we placing mobile nutrients versus immobile nutrients. Um, are the nutrients that I consider mobile in a high rainfall environment? What happens if I'm in a low rainfall environment? Um, we also have to remember that, that for a lot of these nutrients, demand is, is, uh, is constant throughout the crop, although um, it, it varies in, in terms of the, the raw amount that we actually need. But we've got nutrients that are mobile in the plant and nutrients that are immobile in the plant. And they're, and they're listed right there. Um, additionally, we have to keep in mind that plants take up nutrients by different strategies, um, either by root interception, by mass flow, or by diffusion. So nutrients moving by mass flow, this is nutrients that are moving with the moisture running to the crop. Um, nutrients that move by root interception are, are nutrients that that plant, that root actually has to come into physical contact with. Diffusion um, is moving by a concentration gradient. So again, my mobile nutrients, I can probably get away with broadcasting those, allowing those to move by moisture. Um, nutrients that move di by diffusion, I want to focus on how do I create uh, zones of higher concentration to facilitate diffusion. Um, root or nutrients that are taken up by, by root interception. We want to think about placement strategies that place that nutrient as close to the seed as possible. Um, and we can look at the, the different nutrients there. The majority of our nitrogen is taken up by mast flow. So right away I can start to develop a strategy around how am I going to, how am I going to apply that particular nutrient. Uh, phosphorus and potassium, a lot of that's taken up by diffusion. Again, a concentration gradient. So we need to look at our soil tests, understand what our levels are, understand what is optimum, understand where we want to place that to maximize concentration gradients to facilitate that uptake. Um, and then the, the nutrients that move, um, move by root interception there, not a lot of, of uptake there, but again, if you look at, uh, look at uh, potassium, or excuse me, calcium, magnesium, strategies uh, around placement become very important when we start talking about root interception. So three nutrients, if you want to talk about root dominance that you should think about, start playing with. Phosphorus is obvious. Zinc, maybe not so much. And boron, maybe not so much. Those are three key nutrients for most crops that will help create root dominance. The right form, the right placement, the right combination is the key. And 
Um, what we've had really good success with liquid fertilizers placed in the right spot. Lots of different things we can do there, but those are three nutrients you can take home and kind of think about as we go forward when we're talking about root dominance. The next thing we want to do is the right canopy. We want to get in the, the growing conditions, the uh, length of growing season that most of you folks are dealing with and that we deal with, we need to get a crop out of the ground as quickly as possible and covering the ground as quickly as possible so that you create that microclimate um, that you've already started with the straw residue that you have there. And too many of us pay no attention to optimal plant density of the crops we grow. If you talk to a corn grower, he'll tell you that I planted 32,562 plants. If it's soybeans, I planted 120,000 plants. They know that down to the plant. They don't know that. We don't know that in, the, in, uh, in most of dryland agriculture. How many plants of wheat, barley, canola, mustard, peas, whatever the hell it is, do we need per square foot of ground in order to optimize our solar panel? And the truth is, um, we're underseeding most of our cereals, and we're probably overseeding most of our canola and, and mustard. So we need to think about this stuff. And really, it's all about maximizing photosynthetic efficiency. And one of the things that we need to do that is to maximize the amount of solar panels that we're, that we're putting on the ground. And to simplify it to the extreme, more plants equals more photosynthesis. Now, there is a, there is a tipping point um, by geography, by rainfall regime, et cetera, that we need to be cognizant of. But it starts with a conversation about what is optimum. What should my plant population be? And two, what is my population today? Okay. Um, how, a, lot, I, a lot of times I visit with growers and they can tell me how many pounds of seed they're putting down, but we don't know how many seeds we actually put down. We don't know how many plants we should have. Um, doing seed lot testing uh, this last fall on our winter wheat seed and, and my, seeds, my seed counts varied from, from 10,000 seeds per pound to about 18,000 seeds per pound on winter wheat. So going about a strategy where I'm simply seeding by pounds probably isn't going to get me kind of the populations that, that I really want um, if I haven't even considered them to start with. Okay? So one of the things I think is critical for us is that we start a conversation about what is the population that I need and, and what, what do I need to be uh, seeding to get there. And looking at things like seed quality, um, what's the mortality that I actually have? Uh, in walking fields, I can, I can count mortality in cereals up to 30% um, in the same field. Things like row spacing, seedbed utilization, yield environment, all this needs to factor in as well. I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that I know what your optimum plant population should be, um, but what I, what I am suggesting is that you start looking. You start looking at, um, at what your populations are as you're scouting fields. One of the tools that we used this last year was scouting by zone, okay? So in the upper corner there of the screen, um, I'm scouting a field by, uh, uh, on, uh, on aerial imagery. Uh, this is 30 years of, of uh, satellite imagery compressed into one image. Uh, green is good, red is bad, everything in between is in between. And I just wanted to point out here the difference in stand in my good zone versus my poor zone. Okay? Good zone, poor zone. Now this was seeded at a, a flat rate. And this is a grower that we have been having a conversation about what should my population be, what should I be targeting. Um, this is a, a particular grower where we're actually targeting about 32 plants per square foot. Um, we're actually achieving that in some of the parts of the field and it's actually showing up in, in, in yield and uh, we're, we're missing it in other parts of the field. And if we were to dig a little deeper into this zone, what we're going to find is this is a part of the field that tends to be very light in terms of texture, a low organic matter soil. It also is a part of the field that tends to be a little bit more acidic. So we're seeing a lot more mortality associated with that. Um, the other aside here that I think is important to mention is that um, in, in these zones, I'm seeing a week and a half difference in uh, maturity. Uh, so this part of the field has already went through anthesis 
and, and actually shed its anthers. Um, this other part of the field uh, hasn't, uh, th those anthers aren't even emerged yet. Um, so when it talks about trying, when we talk about trying to, to nick up, um, maybe it's a fungicide pass if we're concerned about uh, uh, fusarium head blight. Or maybe it's an insecticide pass if we're concerned about orange wheat blossom midge. Or maybe it's just, hey, I don't have a lot of growing season. I need to get this crop through um, this growing season as quickly as possible. Um, crop staging becomes a pretty critical consideration. If we take this one step further, um, not only is it the amount of plants that we have per square foot, but what it really boils down to when we're talking about yield is the number of spikes per square foot. And so the other thing we're looking at um, this last year is actually doing spike counts. Um, and what I found most intriguing about this activity, and again, this is, this is observation, just boots in the field kind of observation, isn't necessarily research, but what I was expecting to see is as my number of spikes per square foot went up, the size of the spike would go down. And that's actually not what I'm observing right now. So to me, suggests that we might still have opportunity to push that population up, okay? Um, we're, we're gonna, again, this is you know, highly, highly variable based on where you're at and that kind of thing, but at the end of the day, if we're looking at strategies to uh, maximize yield, uh, one of the ways I think to, to, to do that is by actually looking at optimum plant population and spike count per square foot. So at the end of the day, it's about early roots, about early solar panels so that you can optimize um, photosynthetic capacity, CO2 uptake. You can actually shorten up maturity if you do this right, especially with cereals. You can get way better, tighter timing for fungicides, insecticides, everything. Um, you can increase yields, shorten maturity, and increase quality all at the same time if we do this right. And really, it's all about managing photosynth photosynthesis. Um, anybody have an idea what the central atom of the chlorophyll molecule is? It's magnesium. Now, most of us don't worry about magnesium too much, but the truth is 60% of us in this room are magnesium deficient. And if magnesium is the central atom of the chlorophyll molecule, it makes sense to me, especially for the young people in the crowd, that magnesium is gonna become a, an important nutrient as we grow forward. Um, so if you're tissue sampling, I can guarantee you most of your tissue samples early in the growing season are going to be low in magnesium. We need to figure out, we need to start playing around with some magnesium. I'm not saying start running out and spraying every one of your fields with magnesium. I'm saying let's start playing with it because it's the central atom to the most important reaction on the planet and 80% of the tissues I look at in May and June are low in magnesium. There it is. Green area index, you wanna tackle this one? Sure, sure. So again, this, this goes back um, to maximizing the amount of, of, of solar panels that we have uh, per, per unit of, of soil. Um, and uh, we wanna do that as, as quickly as possible. But this is closely tied in my mind to water use efficiency. We're going to, we're going to, water is going to leave the system one of two ways, okay? In a cropping system, water is going to leave the system one of two ways. It's either going to be evaporated, so we've got solar radiation that's hitting the soil surface and it's evaporating that water, or it's going to be um, moved off, this, off the site through transpiration, okay? One of those is good for us, one of those is not so good for us. If we've got water leaving the system through transpiration, that means we're driving the photosynthetic process, that means we're assimilating nitrogen, that means we're assimilating phosphorus, potassium, all those nutrients. We're building bushels. That's what we want to do. Now again, there's probably a tipping point, okay? At some point, we can have so much biomass um, that all we're doing is growing biomass and we're not growing any yield, right? Um, that's not what we want. Uh, but I, I think, again, there's probably opportunity for us to build more bushels simply by looking at this concept of leaf area index or green area index and trying to optimize water use efficiency as it relates to that. To grossly oversimplify, the more square feet of green area you have per square foot of soil, the higher your yield potential. To grossly oversimplify it. 
This is especially true of crops like canola or mustard or those type, types of crops. It's easy to do with those types of crops. All you do is tear off the leaves, spread them around. The, higher, the more square feet of, of leaf area per square foot of soil, the higher your yield potential. The greater your competition with weeds, the better you're going to shorten or hasten maturity, blah, 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 blah. So we're running out of time, Marcus. Um, we need the right engine. We know, we know that if you've got 20 fields, that there's going to be two or three in there that are full-blown hemis, and there's going to be two or three that are little tiny Briggs and Strattons, and there's going to be a whole walk in between. So we need to gear our recommendations, our fertility programs, our balance on a yield potential basis. Invariably, when a new farmer comes on with us, every wheat field has the same yield goal, Every canola field has the same yield goal. Every barley field has the same yield goal. And it's simply not possible because there's a huge difference amongst fields on any farm enterprise in general. So we need to tweak that up on a field-by-field -field basis. And the way we can do that is by starting to measure water. Met stations are getting cheap and reliable. These things have been around forever. People have farmland scattered all over Hell's Half Acre. What's raining on Grandpa's field isn't necessarily raining on Grandma's field. We need to do a better job of this. This is a moisture probe. It was uh, patented in 1957. Virtually nobody uses this thing. It's one of the simplest, most valuable tools you can have on your farm. You can get sexy with high tech. This is an aqua check. Uh, probe. There's all kinds of probes out there now. Most people say this is for irrigation. I think there's a bigger fit for dry land. We need to start measuring soil moisture. We need to me start measuring water that falls out of the sky. Then we can start adding things up. So if we've got a moisture probe and we know that our soil is wet to three feet and we know that it is a clay loam soil, we know that we have somewhere in the range of six to seven inches of crop available water in that soil profile. First four inches go to the factory, every inch after that goes to yield, and if you know a little bit about rainfall, then you can add that in, and bingo bo bangy, you've got some yield potentials based on information like this that I showed you earlier. And virtually no one in the industry uses this information. Of course, uh, you know, this is a direct seeding meeting, right? Everything starts kind of here with the combine, the way we manage residue. We want that mulch layer out there to help create that microclimate that keeps the water in the soil, that reduces erosion, that adds organic matter to the soil, which builds on itself, et cetera, et cetera. And some of you guys in this room have been doing that for years, and others are still saying it won't work. And well, that's okay, but this is where it starts. The ass end of the combine is where it starts, and most of us know that. And row spacing is a, is a big deal. I was talking to your grower earlier today, 12 inch row spacing with a 40% SBU. That system is incredibly flexible from a fertility management perspective. You can literally put the, the kitchen sink down in that seed row. If you're on a 12 inch row spacing and you've got a three quarter inch opener, different ball game, completely different ball game. So there's lots of things we can do uh, with row spacing, stubble height, how we handle the, the straw at the, on the rear end of the combine, et cetera, et cetera. And snow trap. Um, standing stubble, one of the big advantages is that it traps a lot of snow. It traps your neighbor's snow and turns into water that goes into the soil that turns into crop. This is some stuff that we started in 1979 and we took some samples uh, in 1990, well, sorry, this one, this plot was started in 1982 in an environment where farmers said, Elston, you just don't understand. 1982, I was 24 years old, 26 years old, and they would tell me, young man, you don't understand. This will never work. 1982, so actually started in 79. We took samples in 1999. Look at the organic matter levels, uh, how they're increasing with some balanced fertility. And what I do know is with these direct seeding systems, if we get things in balance, we can actually add more organic matter back to the soil than we started with. Everybody assumes that you can, you'll hit some steady state. 
The reason there's only so much organic matter in the soil is because that soil is run out of some, it's been out of balance naturally. If we as farmers can figure out how to balance things up, then we can increase organic matter beyond where we started. And I think we're done. And hopefully we've planted a, a one or two thoughts in your heads, maybe a couple controversies, um, maybe one or two questions, because I think, in fact, we're ahead of time. That's a miracle. Got eight minutes. That's a total miracle. So any questions? One right here. So the question is, how about wheat varieties that have a high aluminum toxicity? Tolerance. Yeah. Tolerance. Yep. yep, okay. Yep. And, um, and so the question was about micronutrients? Okay, you wanna talk a lot? Sure, so I guess to step back just a second, um, I view aluminum tolerant wheat varieties as the tool or as part of the the tool that we're using to move towards a, an environment that's that's more favorable. So hopefully that's a short-term fix and not an, a, a you know a, a long-term solution. Um, but for sure, uh, those those uh, aluminum tolerant varieties, we're not seeing the root pruning. We're seeing a lot more root exploration. Um, so we will see a little bit more micronutrient uptake. Of course, micro, the micronutrients, sometimes their availability is compromised by the pH itself too. Um, so at the end of the day, we haven't addressed the big problem, um, but we are at least, uh, we've got a tool in the meantime to help us, to help us move forward. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're plugging in um, aluminum tolerant rice. One we've thing got I a crop. I mean that, you know, we've got, we've got some situations where our yield differential um, goes from uh, literally zero um, and in some irrigated situations to about 160. Um, well, anything I can do to grow something on that site that's not growing anything is, is a step in the right direction. Absolutely. One of the things I should have mentioned earlier is we spend all of our time talking about soil pH. We really should be talking about percent base saturation of calcium and buffer pH. So if you guys have got good soil tests, pH is good information, but the real, where the rubber hits the road is with base saturation of calcium. And you will run into fields where you'll have low, the same low pH, but one will have a much higher base saturation of calcium, and then the next one, so you don't start with the one that's got the high base saturation of calcium, you start with the one that's got a low pH and a low base saturation of calcium. You pick fields that have a profile that is low to depth. You don't pick one that's got low on the top six inches and high in the bottom 24. And we gotta get started. Low, the, the acid tolerant varieties, it's great stuff. Um, it's a good in-betweener, but eventually we've got to adopt technologies that have been used all over the planet for hundreds of years. We gotta get start, started putting some calcium into the system. So some of you I know in this room have access to wood ash. It's awesome. It not only adds calcium, it adds potash and phosphorus and micronutrients and all kinds of good stuff. It takes stuff out of landfills. Do you know we're filling up landfills with wood ash? It's insane. We've got millions of acres of land that could benefit from it. We've got waste uh, water treatment lime that can be used. We've got all kinds of liming products. I think there's a bunch of booths out there selling it. We've got in Europe and Scandinavia, Norway, the biggest fertilizer company on the planet, Yera, produces calcium nitrate and calcium urea nitrate products that are used there because they have acid soils. And so they add a nitrogen fertilizer that's got calcium in it to counter the acidity that you're adding when you put on nitrogen fertilizer. Can you get that stuff here? Yeah, you can, but you're gonna pay through the nose for it. We need access to products like that so that we can do a better job of growing our crops and do a better job of looking after our soils. So the question is about stratification of soils with uh, continual direct seeding and straw retention. And the answer is yes, we've seen a lot of it. Um, but the, the $64,000 question or million dollar question is what is the impact of it on the crops that we're growing? I personally have felt for a long, long time that we should probably contemplate every, and I 
there's no exit door handy, um, that every so many years we might contemplate flipping or mixing up um, profiles. Because what happens is you get a, a very highly concentrated amount of organic matter in the very top inch or two. You get lots and lots of potassium and other immobile nutrients there. You get acidulation of the soil, extreme acidulation in some cases of the soil at the seeding depth. And it makes sense to me that if we're getting that, it might, well, there's research to show that it actually is beneficial. So we've seen all kinds of it. And it's the immobile nutrients and the immobile soil characteristics that accumulate right at the soil surface. And there's good with it. And there's maybe something that's not so good. Something we're going to have to address. But I, I guess I would suggest don't be afraid to attempt to quantify it. I think sometimes we get dogmatic in our soil sampling strategy saying, oh, I got to do a 0 to 12 or a 0 to 8 or 0 to 6 or whatever. If you're concerned about pH stratification or stratification of immobile nutrients, let's do a 0 to 3 or a 0 to 2, a 0 to 3, 3 to 6, and, and actually see if, if, if that's what we're seeing. In Western Canada, we're pretty much uh, welded to a canola wheat rotation. And in high yield environments, that's not so good because those wheat crops put a lot of residue back on the field that gets really hard to, to deal with. It's part of the reason we're going to wider and wider row spacing and narrow and narrow openers is to clear the residue that we're throwing back in the fields after the big wheat crops. And if you start talking to people about goofy things like baling the straw or God help us burning the straw once in a while, things like that. It's seriously, you gotta be near a door and you gotta be able to run really fast in some circumstances. But to me, it makes a lot of sense. The rotation's retarded to begin with, in a sense. It's, the reason it's there is it's making money, but it's causing problems. And you might have noticed back in one of these pictures that there was actually bales. And that's one way to deal with straw. I mean, there's a lot of nutrients tied up in that straw, but if that straw is causing you all kinds of mechanical issues, that's one way to deal with it. Some guys, if you suggest that to them, man, it's like you spit in their face or something. But that's one option. Nutrient Any other questions? Value, nutrient value today in this, in this wheat straw is about $32 a ton. Uh, if we were to place the NPKS. $32 a ton per, for that wheat straw. And if you're growing big yields, that means the nutrient concentration in your straw is probably higher than the average guy. So the value is probably even higher than that. You turn it into a value per acre and we're generally producing more than a ton per acre yeah. uh, too. So yeah. there's significant value in the residue, economic value. But cattle are making a lot of money now, so hey, yeah. it's all good.